All right, let's go ahead and uh, get started for today. Um, I think no official announcements. Does anyone have any announcement-y kinds of questions before we go? Okay, great. So today's lecture is going to be on solving inference problems in BayesNet. So you'll remember first we looked at uh, what BayesNets are and how to design them. We looked at how to answer uh, kind of abstract questions about BayesNets with a particular structure in general without looking into any of the individual probability tables that actually define BayesNets. And what we're going to be doing today uh, is focused all on, uh, on, on solving problems that actually involve computing real probabilities um, and answering uh, probabilistic kinds of queries using BayesNets. Uh, so just very quick refresher of what we've uh, been looking at for the last couple of classes. Uh, remember that a BayesNet is defined by two things. Uh, the first of those things is a directed acyclic graph, which has one node uh, for every random variable in whatever domain that you're trying to model. Um, and the second thing that a BayesNet has is for every node in that graph, uh, a conditional probability table, uh, which corresponds to the probability of uh, seeing that node take on uh, some particular value for fixed values of all of its parents. And we've seen that uh, we can use BayesNets to provide a kind of implicit encoding of uh, joint distribution over all of the variables in your domain. Uh, you can recover that full joint distribution by taking a product um, of all of these individual conditional probability tables like we have down here at the bottom. Um, but we've seen that by making certain independence assumptions about the structure of your domain, uh, you're allowed to represent that joint distribution uh, implicitly in a way that's much more compact than it would be to write down the full table of joint probabilities all at the same time. Um, so to look at a concrete example of this, uh, we've seen several times now this example of an alarm network. Uh, where there are two things that might set off your alarm, a burglary or an earthquake. Uh, so those both have some kind of prior probability of occurring, uh, which we've called P of B and P of E over here. Uh, depending on whether those things happen or not, your alarm might go off, and that's this uh, big table that we have right here. Uh, and one of the main things to notice here is that the size of this table depends basically on the number of parents uh, that the node has, and then conditioned on that alarm going off, um, you might see your neighbor John call, or you might see your neighbor Mary call. Uh, and we've looked already at how to answer one specific kind of probability query um, in BayesNets that look like this, which is to query the probability um, of the full joint distribution. So for a kind of fixed setting of all of the variables, all at the same time, uh, we already know how to answer a question, uh, a question like this, a question like, what is the probability that the burglar alarm goes off, that there is not an earthquake, that the alarm does go off, that John doesn't call, but Mary does, right? And we've seen that the way in which we answer uh, a query like this uh, is we transform the representation of this joint distribution um, uh, into a product of a bunch of little conditional distributions like this, um, uh, and this is just using the structure of the Bayes net, which tells us that we can always write down uh, this joint distribution in this way. Uh, and then we just look up all of the appropriate values in the tables, uh, and we plug them in down here to get some kind of answer to our question. And so this is one kind of query uh, that we already know how to answer. But there are lots of other probability queries that we want to be able to answer with a Bayes net. Um, so, you know, for example, one natural question is maybe, um, maybe Mary is a really scary lady and I'm afraid that she's going to call me. And so I want to know kind of uh, a priori, what is the probability that today that I will receive a phone call from Mary? Uh, and, you know, I don't care about whether there's an earthquake. I don't care about whether there's an alarm. I just want to know whether Mary's going to call me or not. And you'll notice in particular that, you know, this quantity, uh, which is P of M marginally, the probability, you know, either that Mary does call or that Mary doesn't call uh, is not written down explicitly in any of these tables that we have access to here, right? We have some distributions that look like this that are just marginal probabilities of individual events, but we have them only for the burglar and for the earthquake. And for the case of Mary in particular, um, uh, we don't have a marginal probability. We only have a conditional probability. And so one natural question to ask is, can we recover marginal probabilities of things that are not uh, kind of nodes without parents uh, in this base net. Uh, another natural question that we might want to ask is, well, suppose Mary does call, or suppose John calls, or suppose both of them calls. Uh, can I actually figure out what has happened at my house? That is to say, can we answer the question, what is the probability, uh, say, of a burglary, given that Mary has called, uh, maybe and that John hasn't called, for example? Uh, and so once again, we have things that look like conditional probabilities uh, defining the Bayes net, but we don't have this particular conditional probability written down anywhere. Um, 
And so we need some way of solving the inference problem uh, in a way that will allow us to answer a query of that kind. Um, uh, to give you one more example of the kinds of things that we can do once we're able to answer queries like this, uh, here's a little sneak preview uh, of your next project. Uh, this is a sort of Pac-Man with incomplete information, where Pac-Man's going to be wandering around the board um, and is only able to see the walls immediately next to him. And there are going to be on this board uh, two houses that look kind of like this thing right here. One of the houses is going to contain a ghost, and the other house is going to contain a pellet. Uh, and both of those things are going to be invisible. So you're not actually going to be able to see the ghost or the pellet, and you're only going to get a noisy signal about what is in these houses uh, based on the color of the walls around them. So the pellet's going to be in a house with blue walls, uh, or a house in which most of the walls are probably blue, um, and the ghost is going to be in a house in which most of the walls are probably red. And so you're just from this noisy signal about what's inside going to need to figure out uh, basically what policy Pac-Man should be following, following and how he should be acting. Um, and in particular, we can write down the structure of this world uh, as a base net that looks something like this, where these kinds of you know, observations that you get of the world, when you see colored houses, uh, colored walls down at the bottom, these are the only variables you're going to observe. But ultimately, you care about doing inference about these quantities up here that tell you what is actually in, you know, what is the x and the y position of the food pellet, or what is the x and the y position of the ghost. Um, so let's look at a quick example of how this will work uh, once it's actually done. Um, uh, and I have to throw the window that pops up over to the screen really fast. So you can see Pac-Man wanders around for a little bit, and uh, there's a time budget here. So at some point, it has to make a decision about what's where um, uh, without having seen all of the walls. Uh, and so the key thing here is that when we um, are looking at this base net, we're only going to get a certain set of observations down at the bottom. We're not going to see all of them. And we can't even try to pre-compute what this posterior probability distribution is uh, of the exposition of the food. Sorry, the exposition of the food. Uh, the exposition of the food or the y position of the food because we're not going to know what observations we have until Pac-Man actually goes out in the world and starts receiving uh, images of walls, essentially. Um, so that's a little sneak preview of what's coming up um, and is a general example of the kinds of problems that we like to be able to answer um, using Bayes nets, even though they're not written down explicitly. Um, so here's a kind of high-level outline of the inference section of this class. Uh, today we're going to be looking at two different algorithms uh, for doing probabilistic inference in a Bayes net. Uh, the first of these is called inference by enumeration. It's something that uh, you guys actually know how to do already. Uh, and we're going to see that this procedure of inference by enumeration is a way of getting exact answers to these kinds of probability queries. But we're going to see also that in general, uh, it takes exponential time in the number of hidden variables in this Bayes net. Uh, we don't like exponential time. We would like to find a way of simplifying this. So we're next going to look at another slightly more complicated algorithm for doing probabilistic inference in Bayes nets uh, called variable elimination. And we're going to see that variable elimination also gives us exact answers to our probability queries. Um, we're going to see at the very end of the class that it actually still has worst case exponential uh, time complexity and that we have no reason to believe right now that there is any general purpose algorithm for doing inference in Bayes nets that doesn't run in exponential time. Uh, but we're going to see that this variable elimination procedure uh, still is much easier to work with than inference by enumeration. And for most of the networks that actually come up in practice, for most Bayes nets that you're going to see in the real world, uh, variable elimination will run fast uh, and run an attractable amount of time. Uh, looking ahead to the project, you're going to implement both of these things, uh, and you're going to be able to see for yourselves, basically, that if you try to solve this uh, sort of hidden house problem uh, by enumeration, your program will never finish. And if you try to solve it by elimination, uh, it, it will finish successfully, and you'll get all the points for your project. So those are the two things on the menu today. Uh, and finally, we said before that we're going to talk about how the, the inference problem in general uh, is NP-complete. So there probably isn't a good general purpose algorithm for doing it. Um, and then looking ahead to next week, what we're going to be talking about on Monday uh, is an approximate algorithm for doing inference. So both of these uh, things that we mentioned before, inference by enumeration and inference by elimination, uh, are exact algorithms in the sense that they give you kind of, you know, mathematically precisely the probability that you would expect to get out uh, if you did this explicitly in terms of the joint distribution. Um, 
uh, and in fact that there's a trade-off between computational efficiency uh, and the exactness of the answers that you get. So we're going to be looking next week at a class of sampling algorithms that don't guarantee exact answers to your questions, but run for however long or for however short you want, and will give you kind of the best possible answer that it, you can get uh, in whatever your time budget is. Um, and then finally, looking ahead, we're going to talk about how to actually get these parameters from data rather than having to write them down by hand. Um, so let's jump into inference. At a very high level, uh, when we talk about uh, probabilistic inference uh, in probabilistic models, uh, we mean the kind of general problem of computing some kind of quantity from some representation of a joint probability distribution. And so what we're going to be looking at specifically today uh, is the example of computing posterior probabilities. Uh, that is to say, uh, queries of, of the form, I have some variable, I want to know what the probability distribution is of that variable, uh, having fixed some set of pieces of evidence, some set of observations. But there are other kinds of questions that we can ask, uh, that we can ask as well. Uh, and one that comes up a lot in real world applications uh, is this most likely uh, explanation question that we have right here. And so this is not, you know, suddenly I don't actually care about probabilities anymore. I just want to know what value of this variable uh, is most likely to have explained um, whatever evidence that I'm seeing on the ground here. And this is, you know, when you think of kind of AI or machine learning applications in the wild, uh, most of what you were seeing is not uh, inference producing posterior probabilities, but in fact inference producing most likely explanations. You know, if you have a face detector running, um, I don't actually care what the posterior probability that the pixel at this XY location uh, corresponds to somebody's face is. I just want to know, like, what the most likely region of the image is uh, to contain a face. Um, and that's what these most likely explanation queries look like. Um, I will leave it as an exercise for you guys to figure out how to generalize uh, the techniques that we're talking about today for doing posterior calculations to most likely explanation calculations and said it's basically the same problem, um, but, but this is the slightly more general version looking at posterior probabilities, so that's what we're going to do. Um, uh, and so formally, this inference problem looks... Uh, like this in the following way. Can people see this in the back? I know the font is a little small here. Okay, good. Um, so the general case looks like this. I have some set of evidence variables uh, that we're going to call E1 through EK, and we've written it like this uh, to say that basically for each random variable, which might take on a bunch of different values, I've written that random variable with an uppercase letter. I have fixed it to take on some specific setting that I've written with a lowercase variable. So that's our evidence. Um, the next thing that I have is a query variable, and for the way we present this today, there's only going to be one query variable, but again, it's really straightforward to extend this technique uh, to multiple query variables, and that's uh, something for, for you all to think about when you go home. Um, and so I have the evidence, I have the query variables, uh, and then maybe you know, the structure of my base net has a bunch of other variables in it. Uh, I ultimately don't care about those, they're kind of nuisances and I want to eliminate them, but they are left over uh, as hidden variables. Uh, in this particular kind of query that I'm trying to make. Uh, so this is the information that I start with. Uh, I'm given kind of, these are the lists of each of the three kinds of variables that I care about. Um, and I want to produce a quantity of the following form. What is the posterior distribution of this query variable Q, given all of the evidence, uh, and kind of without respect to all of the hidden variables? Um, is it clear what question we're trying to solve here? Okay, good. Um, so uh, the first procedure that we're going to talk about this is something called inference by enumeration. Uh, inference by enumeration works, again, at a high level in the following way. We're going to start with all of these conditional probability tables that are given to us in our Bayes net, and we're going to throw away from those probability tables all of the rows that are not consistent with the evidence variables that we're actually observing. Uh, and so that's going to leave us with kind of miniature versions of all of the probability tables that our Bayes net defines. We're next going to take all of those probability tables, we're going to stick them together and form one big thing that's kind of like a joint distribution, but it's a representation of the joint distribution that only includes uh, the evidence variables, the settings of the evidence variables that we care about. Um, and having produced that big jointy kind of thing, uh, which looks like this, uh, we're then going to sum out of that all of these hidden variables whose values we don't ultimately care about. Um, and that's going to give us uh, something that looks kind of like a joint distribution just over our query variable and the evidence variables without any of these hidden variables. And finally, 
uh, we're going to take that uh, thing that looks kind of like a joint distribution and we're going to turn it into something that is properly a marginal distribution uh, over the query variable given the evidence variables, uh, which is exactly like we said at the beginning, the thing that we were trying to produce. Um, so view from a thousand feet of, uh, of what inference by enumeration looks like. Um, and like I said before, this is actually something uh, that you folks already know how to do. Uh, and you know, you can see that in the following way. First of all, this probability, okay, so to make this concrete, we want to figure out what the probability is that a burglar alarm gave off, gave, sorry, that a burglar alarm went off uh, given that John has called and Mary has called. Um, sorry. We don't care about the probability the alarm went off. We care about the probability that the house was actually burgled, uh, given that we saw a call from John, we saw a call from Mary. Um, and I don't actually care about the alarm at all, and I don't actually care about the earthquake at all. Um, so I want a distribution that looks like this, uh, the distribution over values for B, uh, given plus John and plus Mary. Um, and this conditional distribution is proportional uh, up to some constant factor uh, that doesn't depend on the values of B themselves to the joint distribution over all of these things. So this joint distribution basically has all of the information that we need, and we write this little kind of fishtail symbol uh, with a B next to it to say that these two quantities are proportional to each other uh, up to some multiplicative constant. Um, so I just care about this joint distribution. This is a joint distribution over a subset of the variables. I know how to turn a joint distribution over all the variables into a joint distribution over a subset of the variables. Uh, we just do it by marginalization. So I'm going to form the joint distribution over all of the variables, which looks like this. And then I'm going to sum out uh, the earthquake, and I'm going to sum out the alarm. Um, and in particular, I know that I have a compact representation of this thing. Uh, it's given to me by the Bayes net, and it looks like this. Hopefully this looks familiar. Um, and so I can just write this whole thing down, and I can compute that sum for all of the values of E and A. And that's going to give me something that, again, kind of contains all of the information that I need uh, to answer uh, this query. Uh, and all I have to do is normalize it at the, excuse me, at the very end. So to make this slightly more explicit, we're going to have something that looks like this. Um, and all I have to do is plug in all the values into this humongous sum that we have down at the bottom uh, to get the answer to my question. Uh, is it clear what's going on here? Yeah. Yeah, by some constant. So uh, there are two ways you could solve this problem. One way you could solve this problem is to say, okay, really what I have here is this thing divided by, you know, marginally what's the probability of plus J and plus M, and that's going to require some extra math to compute, and, you know, we could go through the process, carry that quantity all the way through, and we would wind up with a proper conditional distribution at the end. The other thing we can do is just say, well, I know that eventually this thing that I'm going to get out here has to sum to one. So I'm just going to kind of go through this whole process not caring about what that extra multiplicative constant is, and then I'm going to take whatever I have at the end, and I'm going to normalize it so that everything sums to one. Um, and kind of because the laws of probability tell me that this thing that I'm going to get out at the end uh, should be a normalized probability distribution, that's equivalent to having done uh, computed the normalizing constant at the beginning rather than at the end, but in practice is often a lot less work. It feels like cheating, but you know, you'll see when we go through the math um, that in fact that is the easiest way to do things is just to wait until the end to normalize. Other questions? Yeah. I guess I don't know what you mean by compromise. In fact, you know, the probability distribution tells you more uh, than uh, just having some definite answer, right? It's more, you know, I could, I could either tell you, um, uh, uh, this is inflammatory, but I can't come up with a better example off the top of my head, that Hillary Clinton is going to be elected the next president, or I could tell you uh, that, or, you know, that, that she will probably be next, elected the next president, or I could tell you, um, that, you know, with 0.65 probability, she will be the next president. With 0.35 probability, Donald Trump will be the next president, right? And the second of those statements actually tells you more about what's going on in the world. Um, uh, so I guess the claim is that, in fact, if you want to behave rationally, you want to behave optimally, uh, you need probability distributions rather than uh, kind of hard answers to these questions. Because if you, you know, ultimately you have to make hard decisions, but you can do that more effectively uh, uh, with soft information than with hard information. Does that make sense? Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. So the the key here is that uh, uh, this b given plus j and plus m uh, is, if we hide this for a minute, exactly equal to the joint distribution over uh, all of these things divided by uh, this joint distribution right here, right? Uh, that's just the definition of a conditional distribution. As I take the joint over everything, I divide it by the probability of the things that I'm conditioning on. Um, the nice thing is that this thing down here is just some constant that doesn't depend on B. Um, do you see why that is? What was this thing down here? Uh, sorry, uh, this thing down here is some constant that doesn't depend on B. It only depends on J and M. Um, and so that's just, and because we've fixed values of J and M, that's just a scalar. So these two things are equivalent up to some scalar. Um, and, and so we said before, we could either compute this ahead of time, um, uh, you know, and then we would really have a conditional probability distribution all the way through, or we could say, I'm just going to form the joint distribution over these three things, and then I'm going to turn it into a conditional at the very end um, by normalizing them. Uh, and, you know, to the extent that this is just some number that doesn't affect the rest of the process that we're going through here, uh, it doesn't matter when I do the normalization. Other questions? Okay, great. Uh, so the key thing to note here is that this sum that we've written down has, uh, has four terms, right? One term, two term, three term, four term. Um, and that's, uh, you know, basically a function of um, uh, the number of variables that I tried to sum out here. So I you know, A was hidden and I tried to get rid of A, E was hidden and I tried to get rid of, rid of E, so this sum in here uh, is a sum over all possible values that E can take on, there are two of those, and a sum of all possible values A can take on, and there are two of those. In general, the number of terms in this sum, then, is going to be exponential in the number of hidden variables. Uh, so we saw before that, you know, if you really wanted to form the whole dis joint distribution, that's going to be exponential in the number of total variables in the graph, and doing inference by enumeration instead is going to be exponential in the number of hidden variables in the graph. And that's still not great, uh, right? Because in the real world, our graphs have lots of hidden variables in them. Um, and if you kind of assume reasonable sizes of the domains for all the things here, uh, if I want to get from, uh, you know, sort of the probability of uh, distribution of medical costs, uh, let's use a different color, distribution of medical costs just given ages, we're going to have to sum out everything else in this graph um, and that sum is going to have, I think, order of like 10 trillion terms in it, uh, which is not something that any of us will ever be around uh, to see the end of. Um, uh, so this is going to be the downside of inference by uh, enumeration rather than elimination, which is the next algorithm we're going to look at. Uh, but it's conceptually important to understand what's going on here and why it works. So are people generally happy with the picture? Okay, cool. Um, so... Uh, yeah, let's look at, again, kind of high-level sketches of the two algorithms that we're looking at today. Uh, the way this inference by enumeration procedure works, and the reason it's so slow, um, is because we're first kind of joining together all of the joint distribution, you know, all of the probability distributions involving our hidden variables. We're forming one big thing, uh, and only then are we summing it out uh, to actually get our answer at, at the end. And so, in some sense, by doing this, we've given up... Um, uh, the whole advantage of efficiency that representing things with a Bayes net rather than with a big joint probability table gave us to begin with, right? The reason we wrote the Bayes net down in the way that we did was to avoid forming huge joint distributions over lots of variables. And what we find ourselves doing in doing inference by elimination is precisely forming huge joint distributions uh, over lots of variables. Not all the variables, but all the hidden variables, uh, you know, which in lots of real world applications is going to be same order as, as all the variables themselves. Um, and so the way we're going to get around this instead uh, is basically by only ever doing these sums uh, over the smallest possible sets. And so rather than doing a lot of joining operations at the beginning uh, and then doing a lot of summing operations at the end, we're going to interleave these joining and marginalizing operations. Uh, and we're going to see that for lots of graphs that show up in practice, that's going to allow us to keep uh, the size of all the intermediate uh, probability distributions that we form small. Um, so before we jump into uh, kind of formally how this works uh, and, and to formally recasting this enumeration procedure in terms of these joins and, uh, and sums, uh, we want to develop a little bit of a formal language for thinking about what these, intermediate mean, what these intermediate probability distributions that we produce are. Um, so in general, we're going to call these things factors. We call them 
factors rather than probability distributions because they don't always contain all of the information uh, in probability distributions. Um, uh, and, uh, oh, sorry, uh, let's skip ahead through that. Um, yeah, so in general, you know, we have here this kind of uh, large taxonomy of the kinds of factors uh, that you might see. Um, I don't think it's especially useful to actually like remember the names of all of these things and try to memorize their properties in particular. Uh, the key things here are just that when you're reasoning about how inference algorithms work in general, um, you're always going to be forming kind of intermediate probability distributions over some subset of the variables, and you need to be able to answer a couple of fundamental questions about those intermediate uh, probability distributions or factors that you form. Those questions are, how many numbers does it actually take to represent this table of factors? Um, and what are the subsets of that table, if any, uh, that themselves correspond to proper probability distributions and sum to one? Um, so don't get too hung up on like the names of these things or the cute dragon illustrations or you know the like specific details of what's going on here. Um, the main thing is just for you to be able to kind of look at some representation of a factor and be able to reason about it uh, kind of from first principles. Um, so let's look at the kinds of factors that we're going to encounter in the course of running these algorithms. Um, the first of these is a simple joint distribution, right? Uh, so where we've written uh, things with capital letters like capital X and capital Y, that means we haven't conditioned, we haven't fixed a particular value of those variables, so we're interested in every possible uh, combination of values that these two variables might take on. So, you know, a factor that looks like this is just an ordinary joint distribution of the kind that we've been looking at all semester. Um, it's going to have, you know, an entry P of X comma Y for every value that X might take on and for every value that Y might take on. And all of the factors in the table together are going to sum up uh, to one. So here's an example of what one of these things look like. Um, uh, this is a joint distribution over the temperature and the weather. And we can see here the temperature takes on two values, the weather takes on two values, so the whole table takes on two times two equals four values, uh, and it sums to one over all of the settings of those variables. Uh, remember that we can have joint distributions over more than two variables, uh, and in general the size of this joint distribution is going to be exponential in the number of variables uh, that it describes a distribution over. So that's a joint. Um, and one thing that we're going to see and that we've kind of seen already in the course of running these inference algorithms is sometimes we don't actually need to instantiate full joint distributions because we've already seen some of the evidence. Uh, so we have what we can also call a selected joint here, which is just a slice of a joint distribution uh, for particular values of some evidence variable that we know we were able to fix ahead of time. Uh, uh, and so in particular, this is going to have entries P of X comma Y uh, for only one value of X that we care about, uh, but also for all values of Y. Um, and it's going to sum not to 1, but only to p of x. So to make this concrete, here's an example of one of these things. Uh, this is the probability distribution um, of it being cold uh, for all values of the weather. And we can see that what we've done here basically is pull out uh, these last two rows uh, from this table over here. Uh, and that's given us what we've called a selected joint distribution. So this is, you know, when I observe already that the evidence says that it's cold outside, uh, now I'm not responsible for keeping track of all of the other information uh, in the joint table. And notice again that this sums uh, just up to the marginal probability of x from the previous table. We good? Uh, okay, yeah, and like we said before, the number of capital letters that we see uh, in both of these cases is going to give us the dimensionality of the table. Uh, and so the size of these things is going to be exponential in the number of capital letters. And so we want to keep that quantity small as we're doing inference. Um, we can also have various kinds of conditional distributions. Uh, so here's what we might call a single conditional, uh, which is going to have entries P of Y given X uh, for a fixed X and all Y, remember, because we have a little X here and a big Y here. Uh, it will sum to one. Uh, an example of one of these things is, uh, is like this. So say I already know it's cold, um, and I want to figure out what the distribution is over possible weathers that we might be experiencing. What I want is a table that looks something like this, that just gives me the entries for where it's cold, uh, but that gives me all of the possible values of this variable w uh, on the left-hand side. And so this sums to 1, uh, but it doesn't have any entries for other settings of the variable that we're conditioning on. Uh, when we're trying to answer these kinds of probabilistic inference queries, uh, this is generally the form that I want my answer to take. Um, uh, similar to this, we can have a family of conditionals uh, where, you know, I'm, I'm getting conditional distributions, but I now care both for all values of the evidence variable and all values um, 
uh, of the query variable, uh, what that might take on. And so this is basically going to look like a tiled version of the previous thing that we were looking at before. And we can see again that basically this thing up here uh, corresponds to some slice uh, of this table down here. Um, and that it's going to sum to one, not over the whole thing, but over subsets. Um, so these are uh, kind of conditional distributions uh, in one way. And here's a, the last kind of conditional distribution that we care about, uh, where we might call a specified family, uh, which is basically for a fixed value of the evidence uh, and various values of the conditioning. Uh, we get a table that looks like this. It's not guaranteed to sum to one over anything. Uh, we don't care. Um, uh, and yeah, it's going to have a you know, fixed value of the left-hand side, multiple values of the right-hand side. Um, uh, like so. Um, okay, again, that's a lot. It's not actually important to like remember all of the details of this, uh, so long as you are able to reconstruct from the form uh, of a probability distribution uh, what properties that factor has in terms of how big it is uh, and where and whether it sums to one. Um, uh, so yeah, you know, to kind of summarize what we've done here in general, when we have notation that looks like this, we're denoting some kind of multidimensional array, which may correspond to multiple probability distributions or to a slice of one probability distribution. Uh, the number of dimensions that that array is going to have corresponds in general to the number of capital letters. And so the number of entries is going to be exponential in the number of capital letters. Um, questions about all this before we go on? OK, great. Um, so let's use this language of factors that we've just built up to come back and look at this inference by uh, enumeration uh, algorithm that we were considering before. Uh, so we have here a very simple base net. Uh, hopefully it looks familiar by now. We have three variables. Uh, it's raining. There's traffic. I'm late to class. Um, uh, for this to be a proper base net, we also need to attach to each of these variables uh, some kind of conditional probability distribution. That's going to look like this. And the question that I'm interested in trying to answer now is what is the probability marginally that I am late to class? Um, so how are we going to do that? Well, basically the same way that we were looking at before, right? I'm going to form this sum here, uh, which eliminates, uh, which marginalizes over all of the hidden variables that I don't care about. Um, we can write the form of that joint probability distribution uh, explicitly in the form that the BayesNet allows us to do. Um, and basically what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be, uh, in the course of computing this sum, combining these factors together and then summing them out. So let's look at what that looks like. Um, for uh, this example, we have these three factors, right? The marginal probability of rain, of traffic given rain, uh, and of lateness given traffic. Um, and the first thing that I can do, uh, maybe I just care uh, what the sort of single probability that I am late is. So I'm going to fix this random variable L to take on the value plus L. And what that means is that in the course of computing this, um, I can now actually start to throw away parts of these tables. Um, oh dear. Sorry. Connection lost. OK, well, we can work with this. Uh, I can begin to throw away parts of these tables, right? So what we've done in moving from the first step here to the second step here, um, is we've just discarded the rows from this table P of L given T uh, that do not correspond, uh, that correspond to minus L, right? So we're left with something that looks like this. And we can see that we've already saved ourselves a little bit of computation effort um, uh, by throwing those rows away. Uh, so having done that, uh, all we have to do is take these factors that are remaining, uh, join them all together, and then eliminate the hidden variables. Uh, so there are two primitive operations here. Uh, the first of which we call join. Uh, and you know, if you've seen a database join, if you've taken a database classes before, you can think of this as basically being the same kind of operation as a database join, where we're going to take, you know, we're going to choose some variable that we're going to join over. Uh, and we're going to take all of the different factors that involve that variable, and we're going to combine them together, uh, kind of gluing them together in places where the values that they assign to the joining variable are the same. Uh, so to make that kind of concrete, uh, for this part of the graph, when we're joining on R, this reigning variable, well, there are two factors uh, that involve R, right? There's the prior probability of R, um, the prior probability of R, and the probability uh, of traffic. Given R, 
Um, and so all I'm going to do in joining these two things together uh, is to kind of multiply them together pointwise, right? So I'm going to produce, uh, by doing that, the joint distribution of R and T. This just falls out of the, the rules of probability. Uh, and I'm going to compute it in the following way, uh, just like this down at the bottom. Uh, do people see how we got here? Okay, so this is the simplest thing that one of these join operations look like. But basically what we've done is we've said uh, for every val value that every variable that shows up in any one of these factors might take on, we're going to multiply together the parts of the factors that talk about that setting, those settings of the variables. So, you know, sort of concretely looking at this first row here, um, I have plus R and plus T. So I'm going to reach into this factor and I'm going to pull out the plus R. I'm going to reach into this factor and I'm going to pull out the plus R plus T. I'm going to multiply those two things together and I'm going to get the 0.08 that we see here. Um, so that's how a join operation works. Good so far? Yeah. Uh, we'll see what that happens uh, actually right now. You can kind of think of this uh, as basically smashing these two nodes in the Bayes net together and turning them into a single node associated with a single random variable uh, for which the space of values it can take on is the product of all of the different values its individual pieces might take on. So, you know, basically instead of having R which might have two values and T which might have two values, we have this, you know, random variable associated with a factor r comma t, uh, which is going to have one value for every possible combination of r and t. Uh, yeah, and so in fact what we're doing in the, in the process of sort of joining things together is we're kind of destroying the Bayes net. Uh, we're taking each node, we're smashing it into the nodes that it's connected to, and in inference by enumeration, we're going to keep doing that until we have only one random variable left in the Bayes net, uh, and then we sum everything up. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, a very useful kind of graphical intuition to have uh, for what's going on in these things. And we're going to see some examples in a minute of, of where that becomes really useful. Um, so what we saw here is joining, uh, you know, sort of two variables on, uh, or two factors on a single variable. Uh, we can do versions of this with greater multiplicity that look kind of like this. Uh, you know, so here's an example of, of joining twice in a row uh, and winding up with a bigger table. Uh, we're first going to join on R, just like we were looking at on the previous slide. Uh, and so we're going to carry over in this first step uh, this L given T because it doesn't involve R at all. Uh, and we're going to form this new factor, P of R comma T, which looks like this. We already saw how to get that. And we saw before, you know, like we were talking about, that this basically corresponds to a kind of reduced version of the Bayes net that only has uh, two probability tables and correspondingly two random variables associated with it. Um, having done this, we can then do that join operation again, right? Because this is a random variable and this is a random variable uh, and we can join them together and that'll give us a big joint table, uh, P of R, L, and T. Um, how many entries is this table going to have to have? Eight, right? Because it's a joint, you know, we can think of it one way as a joint distribution over all of the variables. Um, and so it's going to look like this. How did we get this table? Well, to form this row, we have plus R, plus T, plus L. So we match as much of that as is possible uh, in this table up here. Here's the plus R plus T part, so that's going to come down. Uh, and then we have uh, plus T plus L. We match as much of it as possible down here, and that's going to come up as well. And that's how we get this first row in the table. And so we're going to repeat that operation for all of the rows, and that's how we're going to form the full joint table. And so the thing to notice in particular here, that as we're doing this, uh, you know, not all of these three variables appear uh, in all of the tables that we're joining together. And so we're just taking as much as we can. Uh, and one way of thinking this is that we're kind of like tiling these things over each other on the variables uh, that are missing. And maybe that's also a useful uh, graphical intuition to have. Uh, so multiple joins. Questions? Yeah. Uh, sorry, why is the question? The question is, why is there not? I'm not sure I understand. Why is there? The question is, why is there not an R down here? Uh, oh, like why? Why am I not computing this? Oh, 
Okay. Um, yeah, okay, so the, the point is here, right, in this, when we're doing this join operation, uh, under the hood this is actually just multiplication of distribution of the way that we've been looking at before, right? If I multiply P of R times P of T given R, that's going to give me the joint distribution over R and T. If I multiply this thing, oh, sorry, I see what you're asking, like what happened to T over here? Um, yeah, so, I mean, in this case, right, the Bayes net tells me, the Bayes net tells me that P of L given T comma R, that's the world's worst T, uh, T comma R, uh, is equal to this thing down here. This is not showing up. Uh, okay. Um, until these two things synchronize. The Bayes net tells me that probability of uh, L given, given T comma R is just equal to the probability of L given T, right? That's what we're allowed to assume from the structure of the space net on the left-hand side, right? So the reason I'm allowed to multiply um, these two things together is, you know, because I can definitely multiply uh, P of R comma T with P of L given R comma T, and that is all this thing is. Yeah. Correct. Does that help? Okay. Uh, so an important question. What if we wanted to get out uh, P of L given R, uh, R comma T? What would we do to this table that we have on the left side here? So like, you know, numerically, what operation should I do to this table on the right to transform it from a joint distribution into a conditional distribution? Uh, okay, I don't want to sum, right, because I care about all of the values uh, that these things might take on, uh, right? I don't want to kind of throw away any of the rows, which is what summing will do. Um, so what do I want to do to it instead? Yeah. Okay, good. So the magic word is normalize, right? What we're going to do is we're going to, for each fixed value that R and T might take on, um, we're going to normalize the values of R. Sorry, for each fixed value that, uh, yeah, the T and R might take on, we're going to normalize over all the possible values of L, right? So here's a fixed setting of R and T. There are two values of L associated with it, plus L and minus L. So we're going to take these two numbers, we're going to add them together, and then we're going to divide them by that sum. And that'll give us something such that for this little slice of the table corresponds to a probability distribution over L, which is what we want, given T and R. OK, this is really important, because this is the trick that we're going to be using for the rest of the day to make sure that the distributions that we get are actually the distributions that we want. So does that make sense to people? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So if we back up uh, a couple of slides, too many slides. Yeah, to this slide. Um, this thing that we did to transform, you know, to relate these two things to each other is exactly the same normalization trick that we've just done at the very end here. Um, okay, come on. Too many slides. Okay, so that was joining. Um, and the next thing that we're going to look at uh, is having joined, uh, how do we marginalize? Um, and that's going to go as follows. Sorry. Okay, so this is an operation that we call eliminate. Uh, and we're going to use eliminate, marginalize, sum more or less interchangeably here. They all mean the same thing. 
Um, and what this does is it takes one of these kind of compound factors that we've built up, one of these nodes in the graph that has multiple variables sitting inside of it, and it removes one of those nodes from the graph, or removes one of those variables altogether. Uh, and what that's going to do kind of back in probability land is it's going to reduce the size of the table that we need uh, to represent that node in the graph. And so this is something that we're going to do uh, to all of these uh, nuisance hidden variables uh, to remove them from consideration and take them out of the final probability distribution that we come up with a representation of. Um, so at a high level, this operation looks like this. Um, and you can see all we've done here is we've said for each value uh, of, that t might take on, we're going to kind of combine all of the rows that have that value of t for whatever value of r. And that's going to remove r from this table. And it's going to give us a quantity that only involves t and that sums to 1. Um, so this is just the normal marginalization that you've seen already in, in the work that you've been doing with probability. Um, and by analogy to joining, uh, we can do this uh, repeatedly and we can do this for multiple variables also. So if I start with a big joint table over R, T, and L, uh, which remember is what we produced on the previous, uh, in the previous section, I can start to shrink this first by taking R out of the table. How big is the table that I'm going to get once I've removed R? Four entries, right? Because half the entries involve R, uh, or half the entries involve plus R, half the entries involve min minus R, and we're smashing those together. Uh, so we take out R, we get something that looks like this. We take out T, we get something that looks like this. And so we've gone from uh, either you know a sort of single vector that can take on a bunch of different values and requires a big probability table to represent, or equivalently a joint distribution over a lot of variables, to a marginal distribution over a single variable. Um, uh, here is a cute graphic showing you what we have done so far. Um, so in particular, this is a depiction of this uh, inference by elimination, or sorry, inference by enumeration algorithm, uh, which involves first doing as many joins as we can possibly do, joining everything together, and then doing all of the eliminations in one pass. Um, and we've seen that in the course of doing this, you know, the more you join, the bigger and bigger your tables get. The more you eliminate, the smaller and smaller your tables get. And the ultimate running time of this algorithm is going to depend on the size of the largest table you build up as a result of a join operation. So we want to keep the tables small. And the way we're going to do that is rather than joining, 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 and then summing, 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 we're going to interleave those two operations in uh, the order that allows us to keep the tables as small as possible. Um, one kind of nice thing about all of this uh, is that it has all these nice graphical interpretations, but you can also kind of go back down and think about what we're doing in terms of uh, just shuffling around sums in a representation of the marginal probability distribution. And the only difference between these two algorithms, inference by enumeration and by elimination, is the order in which we take sums in our marginal distribution, right? So, you know, the BaysNet tells me that this is what my joint distribution looks like. If I want to remove T and R from the representation of this joint distribution, one thing I can do um, is kind of multiply all these things together initially and then sum everything else out at the end. But we can be smarter about this, right? We can look at this and we can notice uh, that if I'm summing over T and then summing over R, well, I have a term here. Uh, let's draw that in a different color. I have a term here that doesn't involve R at all. And so I can bring that out in front of the sum um, and in fact, what that corresponds to back in algorithm land uh, is changing the order in which we've done these join and eliminate operations. So rather than multiply everything and then sum everything, we're going to multiply, sum, multiply, sum. And we're going to see momentarily that this actually allows us to do things faster uh, and, and answer the same kind of query that we were looking at before. Um, let's make this concrete. Um, suppose I have here... Uh, the same example involving rain, uh, traffic, and lateness. Uh, I'm going to start it the same way I started it before. So I'm going to join on R, and I'm going to wind up with two factors here, one involving R and T, and one just involving L. And you'll remember what we did before was we said, okay, now I'm going to take these two factors, I'm going to join them again, join them again, and get a single factor left in the graph. What we're going to do instead here is we're going to sum out R. Because we don't care about R, we're trying to eliminate it. And having summed out R, we get basically just a smaller version of this graph. And in particular, we wind up with a Bayes net that requires fewer numbers to represent. We have only the two values for t and only the four values for l and t. And now, what am I going to do next? Only two choices, right? Who says join? Who says sum? OK, is there anything to sum? 
there's not really anything to sum, right? I don't have any joint distributions to sum out. Um, so we're going to join. And that join looks the same as it did before. Uh, and now we wind up with something that has two variables in it that we can sum over. Uh, and that's going to give us our final answer, uh, which is the marginal distribution of being late. Um, question, have we actually saved ourselves any time by doing this? Hands for yes. Hands for no. A lot of uncertainty, right? Okay, so we have, right? You'll remember before when we were going through this whole process, we built up a table that had eight uh, terms in it. And here we only ever have four terms in any of our tables. And to the extent that that's going to dominate the running time processing these tables, uh, we want to keep them as small as possible. And so we've saved ourselves um, a factor of two here. Uh, that may not seem very impressive, but we're going to look at examples of Bayes nets in the future uh, uh, where kind of doing the naive... Uh, enumeration procedure is going to take exponential time, but doing this uh, inference by elimination with the proper elimination order uh, is going to allow us to do things in only polynomial time. Um, questions about how this elimination procedure works? Okay, so I think, you know, again, the things to have in your head here are like graphically what's going on to the Bayes net as we're deleting nodes from it or removing variables from kind of compound factors that we've built up. Um, and then understanding also how that graphical process that we're going through relates to the actual rearrangement of terms and sums uh, when we kind of write everything out explicitly in terms of probability distributions. So if you can do those two things, uh, you're set. Um, one thing that we haven't talked about at all in, in the presentation of this algorithm is what to do when there's actually evidence involved. Um, and here it's basically the same uh, as we saw in uh, the enumeration procedure, right? When I have evidence, say I want to fix uh, plus r, it is raining outside, all I'm going to do is throw away, uh, before I start any of this process, uh, the pieces of the table that I don't care about, where here the piece of the table that I don't care about uh, is this minus r. Um, uh, and then everything else is going to proceed as follows. So we've similarly thrown away all the minus r uh, pieces from this table, um, and then we're going to go through the same process. But the whole point is that in doing this now, we don't have to carry around or, or multiply together any numbers uh, that involve an outcome that we ultimately don't care about. Um, so we do this kind of removal of things from the table to begin with, and then we proceed in the presence of evidence in exactly the same way as we proceeded uh, in the absence of evidence. And we're just going to carry around those evidence variables on the right-hand side um, of all of the factors where they would have otherwise appeared. Um, people happy with this? Okay, great. Um, yeah, and so, you know, in particular, what we get at the end of this, we saw before, when there was no evidence, what we got out was a sort of marginal distribution uh, over just the query variable. And here, what we're going to get out instead is something that looks like a selected joint distribution that involves both the query variable and whatever evidence we fixed ahead of time. And remember, the reason what we're getting is a joint distribution rather than a marginal distribution um, is just because all of the quantities that we started out with look like the kind of base quantities in our Bayes net. And when we multiply those things together uh, without marginal, you know, without conditioning or marginalizing, all we're ever going to get is a joint distribution. So what we wind up with at the end is something that looks like a fragment of a joint distribution. Um, and so like we said at the very beginning of class, we can then uh, take that fragment of a joint distribution uh, and just make all of the rows sum to one, uh, and that'll give us a conditional distribution that has the right form. Do people believe that this is uh, a valid thing to do? Does anyone not believe that this is a valid thing to do? Okay, good. Uh, so I trust that you're all convinced, and if you're not, uh, go stare at these slides a little bit more, and, and hopefully you will uh, become convinced. Uh, so we just normalize, uh, and we can wait to normalize till the very end, uh, and that's fine. So uh, here's variable elimination in general. Uh, you know, remember the same setup as we had before. We start with our query variable uh, and some fixed settings of all of our evidence variables. We're going to start with an initial set of factors that just correspond to the conditional probability tables provided by the Bayes net, maybe with the parts that we don't care about thrown away. And while there are still hidden variables, we're just going to pick up one of those hidden variables. We're first going to join together all of the tables that involve that hidden variable, and then we're going to sum the hidden variable out of that table. And what we're going to be left with is a collection of CPTs corresponding to, you know, a kind of reduced Bayes net that doesn't involve the variable uh, that we were trying to get rid of. Um, and we're just going to keep going through this process um, 
until we've removed all the hidden variables and what we're left with is a conditional probability table uh, of the appropriate form. Um, the key thing to notice here is that in going through this process, uh, we have a choice, right? We, you know, there's a step that just says pick up some hidden variable and remove it. And it turns out the order in which you pick up those hidden variables can make a huge difference um, uh, in the running time of this algorithm. Uh, the good news is that for lots of graphs that we care about, there it's often easy to figure out um, uh, what order we should be removing hidden variables uh, in order to do this process as efficiently as possible. The bad news is, A, there exist graphs for which it is not possible uh, to find any good elimination ordering that won't you know, sort of make us at some point spend exponential time. And even worse, uh, there exist graphs for which there exists a good elimination ordering, but finding that elimination ordering is itself an NP-hard problem. Um, so, uh, you know, this is not magic, this is not a good general purpose procedure, uh, but most of the time we can't actually get away with it. Um, so let's look at a concrete example of this. Uh, so here's our alarm thing again. We recognize the Bayes net, and now we're going to solve this alarm thing uh, using inference by elimination. Uh, so the first thing that I want to do uh, is, remember, I don't, uh, I want to get this out, and I'm fixing the values of this and this. Uh, so these are shaded in, remembering how that notation works. Um, and so I need to get rid of A, and I need to get rid of E. Let's get rid of A first. Uh, which are the factors here that involve A? Um, well, we have this factor, this factor, and this factor. So we're going to join all three of these factors at the same time. And what that's going to give us uh, is a factor that looks like this and is going to correspond, uh, you know, basically to uh, some big node in the table where we've removed A and coupled everything else together. And we're then going to remove A from that factor. And what we're left with is a graph that looks like this. And so if we wanted to kind of draw this concretely again, uh, this would look like uh, this. We have a graph uh, here. Do people see kind of how that process works? So we took all the things at the bottom, because they all depend on A. We combined them together into a big factor, a big conditional probability table, and then we removed A from that conditional probability table. So we're left with three factors, and then we're just going to repeat this process. Uh, we're going to take those three factors, we're going to grab the ones uh, that involve E, which is the last variable we have to eliminate. We're going to combine them together, uh, and we're left with just these two factors here. And then we're going to take these two factors, we're going to join them together. Um, and now, remember what I have is basically at this point a graph that just looks like this, where the only names of variables that appear in this single node that we have left uh, are the evidence variables and the query variable. And so all I have to do is normalize this thing uh, to get an answer to my query. And so by normalization, we wind up with uh, something that's written over there, uh, but that looks like this. Um, and that's the answer to our question. Um, do people see how this works? OK. Um, and just to look at what's going on under the hood, you know, again, remember that all we've done here um, is kind of in a graphical way found an efficient process for solving uh, this big sum that we have here. Can people see what's on the slide? Uh, the, you know, this is not actually super important. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it um, now, but you really should go back and look at this after class um, because understanding the relationship between the kind of sum version of what we're doing and the drawing pictures version of what we're doing uh, is the heart of how this process works. But, you know, in particular, when I um, uh, sort of move this B out in front, that was saying, first, I'm going to join on A, and so I'm going to take only the terms involving A, and I'm going to combine them together, and that's going to give me a factor that looks like this. And that's what happens when we remove the first sum from this equation. And then we notice that there are terms that don't depend on E, like this one. And so we're going to pull the terms that don't depend E out in front, and we're going to smash together the factor involving E, and then we're left with something that is a slice of a joint distribution. Um, and the thing to notice here uh, uh, and here, I guess, is where it becomes important, is that order can matter. Um, uh, I think it's actually easiest if we just skip ahead to the next slide and look at this example. So here's a graph. Um, and I claim for this graph, uh, if I'm trying to figure out the probability of some fixed xn, given all of the y variables at the bottom. So I'm going to observe all of these down here. There is an elimination ordering on this graph that will allow me to do everything in linear time. 
And there's an elimination ordering on this graph that will allow me to do things in exponential time. Um, somebody suggest an elimination ordering. Basically, I have two choices, right? The x's are all kind of symmetric, so it's just a question of do I want to start with x or do I want to start with z on the first term? Who thinks I should start with x? Who thinks I should start with z? One for z. Okay. Um, so let's see what would happen if I were to start with z. What are the CPTs that involve z in this graph? Well, there's the prior probability of z up here. There's x1 given z. There's x2 given z. Up through xn given z, like this, right? So I'm going to take all of these things together, and I'm going to combine them all together into a single joint probability table. How many capital letters are in the factor name for that probability table? n plus 1 of them, right? It's z and n1 and, uh, sorry, x1 and x2 and x3 and so on and so forth, right? So this is the object that we're going to have to build up and then sum z out of in order to proceed with inference in the rest of this problem. How many terms does this table have? How many rows? 2 to the n plus 1. 2 to the n plus 1 rows, exactly. So if we pick z first, the first thing that we're going to do in the process of running the elimination algorithm is to construct a factor uh, that takes exponential space to represent. Uh, and this is terrible, right? This is what we want to avoid. So let's not do z. Uh, what's going to happen instead uh, if I start with x? Uh, and let's say we're trying to figure out xn, so we don't want to get rid of that. So let's get rid of x1. Okay? Uh, what's going to happen? What are the terms involving x1? Right, uh, there's p of x1 given uh, z, and there's p of y1, uh, sorry, uh, y1 given x1, like this. Just these two, and no other factor in this graph involves the quantity x1. So we're going to join these two things together. We're going to get a table with four entries in it, if these are binary variables, um, and then that's just going to sit there. Uh, on our factor graph until the end of time. Um, and so in particular, if we do this for each of these x's, you know, at no point will we ever have to build up a graph uh, that is too big uh, until we finally remove z. But at that point, we have kind of conditioned on y, and so it's all, it'll all work out, and it'll be fast. Um, so the key here is just that the elimination order really does matter. Uh, and I encourage you sorry, to go uh, uh, work through an example that looks like this uh, on your own at home. OK, good. So here's an example of a graph um, uh, yeah, where the ordering that we chose for elimination uh, made a big difference in the space and the time complexity of this algorithm. Um, uh, so a natural question we can ask is, is it the case that for any phase net, uh, there's always an elimination ordering that won't create an inter intermediate factor that's too much bigger than any of the factors that it takes to represent the Bayes net initially? Uh, and so the answer to that is no. Uh, and here is an example um, of a Bayes net for which that is, uh, well, the answer to that question is probably no. Uh, and if you can prove that it's actually no, there's a lot of money waiting for you. Um, but here's an example of uh, some reason to believe uh, that there isn't an efficient way to do this in general. Uh, how many people have seen, like, know, know what I mean when I say a problem is NP-complete? How many people don't? OK, good. So um, without going into too much detail, there's a large class um, of problems that exist in computer science uh, for which no known um, polynomial time algorithm exists, uh, and which are only known to be solvable by um, basically a kind of weird kind of non-existent computer that uh, can always guess correctly uh, whenever it needs to make a guess. Um, this whole class of problems, or a big chunk of this class of problems, uh, are all actually closely related to each other in the sense that if I knew how to solve one of these problems, I would immediately be able to translate that solution into a solution for every other problem in this class. Um, and you know, you've probably heard of a lot of the examples of, of the sort of canonical NP-complete problems. So the traveling salesman problem is one of them. Um, satisfiability of Boolean formulas is one of them. Um, 
uh, you know, the knapsack problem where I have a bunch of blocky objects and I'm trying to fit as many of them as possible into a bag of fixed size is one of them. And, you know, there are books out there that are just lists and lists and lists of examples of NP-complete problems um, and, uh, and the ways in which they relate to each other. Um, way beyond the scope of this class, and we're only bringing it up here uh, to point out to you that this problem of doing inference uh, in graphical models uh, is as hard as any of the other problems in that class. So basically, you know, we have very good reason to believe because people have spent decades uh, trying to show uh, that there is no algorithm uh, that will efficiently, given a kind of Boolean formula of this form with a bunch of binary variables, there is no algorithm for finding settings of all those variables uh, uh, that will cause this formula to become true or for determining for a fixed formula whether we can do that or not. Uh, so just... Trust me when I say we really, really, really think that there is no way to do this efficiently. Um, and the point here is just that uh, if we could do f efficient inference in Bayesnets, that would be a way of solving this problem efficiently. And the way we do that is as follows. Uh, we say for each of these little uh, x variables that we're trying to find settings for, uh, we make a variable in our Bayesnet for each of these. And then for every one of these clauses, uh, and basically, the way this problem works is we have a bunch of clauses. Each clause is satisfied uh, if any individual variable in it uh, takes on the right value, and we're trying to satisfy all of the clauses at the same time. So we're going to say, we're going to create one of these y variables for every clause in our problem, and we're going to define the conditional probability table for y in such a way that um, uh, y will be you know, set to true uh, if and only if all of the x's above it uh, take on the right value. And then we're going to kind of recursively say, OK, for each pair of y's, um, are they both satisfied? And we're going to go up the tree until we get a variable z at the root, which is going to be true only if every one of these clauses is satisfied. Um, and so the point here is that if I ask using my uh, you know, probabilistic algorithm of choice, inference algorithm of choice, uh, what is the marginal probability of z? That's going to be non-zero only if there's some way of setting all of these x's. Um, you, know, you know, in a way that causes Z to be true. And so if we could answer this question, we could actually find a setting of all of these variables uh, and, you know, basically everything else in the world would break algorithmically if this were true. Uh, so it's probably not. Uh, and there is no, right now, there's no known efficient general purpose probabilistic inference algorithm. That's a really strong statement, right? That's not just saying that inference by elimination is bad or inference by enumeration is bad. It's saying that probably there is no algorithm of any kind that you could ever write down that will be able to solve this problem efficiently. Um, I said one more thing, uh, which is uh, we're not going to talk about in this class, but would be talked about if you, you know, take a later graphical models class, which is that, you know, are there algorithms for finding efficient elimination orderings when they exist? Um, and... Uh, that involves some slightly complicated graph theory, but the answer is basically no. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, however, there are also lots of classes of graphical models of, of Bayes nets uh, where there are efficient elimination algorithms. Uh, an example of that is uh, what are called polytrees. So if I have a kind of general uh, Bayes net that looks like this, uh, where there are no cycles, directed or undirected, then there's always an efficient elimination ordering. What do people think that elimination, that efficient ordering is? Think back to the example we were looking at before with the, the x's and the y's. This is a tree. Which are you connections to others? Uh, okay, connections of what kind? Okay, exactly. So, remember, in a tree, for you to be a tree, you have to have leaves. And, you know, if your tree is directed in this way, those leaves are always going to be things that depend, uh, you, you know, basically on no parents, right? So the number of factors involving this node will always be small. The number of factors involving this node will always be small. And in general, as long as I start from the leaves and I work my way down, I'm never creating factors that involve kind of things other than a leaf and maybe its parent, uh, depending on which direction things are coming in from. So if you have a tree and you work your way in from the leaves outward, um, 
That's always an efficient elimination ordering, and lots of kind of real-world problems uh, turn out to have tree structures. So this is a really nice thing. Um, one other consequence of this is if I have a graph that's not a tree, and there's you know some elimination I can do that will turn it into a tree, even if that elimination is a little bit expensive, it's often worth it to do, because having kind of removed one variable or removed two variables and turned my graph into a tree, I now have a linear time operation for solving the rest of the graph. Um, so this is called cut set conditioning. Um, it's also used sometimes in the context of, uh, of CSPs, although we didn't see that this semester. Um, and it's a way of kind of taking graphs that are almost tree-shaped and using that fact to, to get basically uh, an inference algorithm that's almost as good as the one for trees. Um, so that's it for inference and Bayes nets. Um, I don't know why sampling is crossed out yet here because we have not actually done sampling yet. Um, but what we did look at today is a bunch of algorithms. Oh, I see the things have just not lined up properly. Uh, we looked at two algorithms. Uh, we looked at uh, inference by enumeration and inference by variable elimination. We saw that uh, in general these are both worst case uh, NP hard, so there probably isn't an efficient algorithm uh, for doing solving this problem in general. Uh, but we saw that you know, enumeration is always going to run in exponential time uh, in the number of, uh, of hidden variables, of nuisance variables you have in your graph, uh, but elimination will sometimes allow you to do things much faster. Um, uh, and that's it. So, questions? Okay, great. Have a good weekend.